I want to get into this. It's this probably a strange title, but I want to talk to you about flipping the commandments. And Mark said it's the Ten Commandments. Um, so I, I, I want to talk with you about flipping the commandments. What do you mean? Well, there's a lot of people say, yeah, I never read the Old Testament. There's so many rules. It's, you shall not do this. You shall not do that. And you look at the Ten Commandments. I don't know if you remember a comedian named George Carlin. He was a very committed atheist and pretty snide. Funny, but snide. And he said, yeah, there's all these people. And they're saying God loves them and all this kind of stuff. And he said, yeah, I love you. And I'll do this for you, this for you, and this for you. Oh, and by the way, there's a list of ten things. And if you don't obey them, I'll kill you. Well, that's an extreme of what a lot of people think about the Old Testament in general. And I want you to understand what I'm basing this on, that the Old Testament and the New Testament are both about the New Covenant. They're both about Jesus. It's, the Old Testament is the Bible that Jesus preached from, the Bible that Paul preached from, the Bible that the apostles that traveled with Jesus preached from. And for us to not read it, if I gave you just the New Testament, it'd be like giving you the last quarter of a book in terms of the content. The last quarter of a book. And you think you'd understand the book. I don't think so. So the Ten Commandments are representative if they summarize the law. Law is not a bad word. Paul said the law is good if you know how to use it. So how do we use it? Well, this is, I hope this encourages you because i got a, on the inside, I've got a Cheshire cat grin. On the outside, i got cough medicine in me. Sorry, my voice is kind of a cross between Darth Vader and Gilbert Godfrey. So... <laughs> So, um, I'm going to, why are there so many you shall nots? Why are there so many thou shalt nots in Scripture? Eight out of the Ten Commandments are these negative statements. Why is that? All I can say is that God prefers to give us a few boundaries to tell us, you're free, but you don't do these things. They're kind of universal boundaries. But within those limitations, we have a saying in the U.S., if there's no law against it, we can do it, right? There's a lot of countries in the world that say, if there's no law that permits it, we'd better not do it. So that's, that's the reasoning behind good laws being these thou shalt nots, because they draw limits, not, o- not only boundaries for you that are broad, but also boundaries on the power of the government uh, of the state to boss you around. A lot of states have forgotten that, but it's, it's, it's true. So the question is, where do you know the positives? Okay, you know that you're not supposed to do this. What are you supposed to do? Well, we're going to see that right now. Let's turn the Ten Commandments, each of them, into positives. What's the first commandment? Look up there, because most people can't remember a thing without an iPhone or or projection. Um, There's going to be 30 minutes of silence in heaven just because they're fixing face some I don't know some app. So, Apple TV is that? It's not. Oh, you got the old version. Not even 4K. No wonder. So that's heaven talk. That's St. Peter. So, all right. So what's the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Now, I've I've summarized them. I've I've made them abbreviated, but I got the gist. You shall have no other gods before me. What if you flip that into a positive? You shall have me. Think about that. You're not stuck with a statue that you built that might catch fire. You're not stuck with... A God like a cow that you worship that may kick you or walk into a semi someday. You, and I mean, I'm being derisive about those things because, you know, in Scripture, idolatry was called uh, fornication. It's a very serious thing. So so he says, you're going to have me, the, the God of the universe. And how do you have him? Well, Jesus said, when I go away... I'm going to send you the comfort of meaning the Holy Spirit, and he will guide you into all truth. He will guide you. So the positives, God doesn't give us, the, if there's a law that says you have to do this, you know what human nature does. Okay, I'm going to do the minimum because I don't like this. You've got a lot of positive laws lately. A lot of states do. You have, uh, the country does. You have to have this health insurance or you pay a fine. You have to let us teach your children. You have to wear a mask. You have to let us teach your children. The, about diversity, our, our version of diversity. You have to let us provide a counselor and you don't get to hear what your fifth grader is saying to the counselor. There's, you have to, you have to, you have to. These are bad laws. Well, what is the positive? Well, the good thing is, whoever you are, the positives are individualized for you, as we're going to see, especially through commandments 6 through 10. 
by the Holy Spirit himself, God himself, the author of the book, will explain it to you. Now, not all by yourself. That's why you need each other. That's why you have meetings. That's why you have teachers like Mike. That's why you have pastors like, like the Hoffman guys and, 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 and why you have mentors. It's why you have home, home fellowship groups, home study groups, whatever you call them. I just call them church. That's, that's why you have these groups. It's because you need one another. Iron sharpens iron, right? You need each other in order for Christ to be formed in you. And that takes us to the second commandment. Second commandment is, you shall not make idols. Basically, it's about idols. You shall not make idols, nor worship them, nor serve them. What's the positive? In other words, look, it's saying you don't make idols. It doesn't mean, I've met people who won't even allow family photographs, because that's an image. You shall not make a graven image, and that's an image. And you don't, you shouldn't have any statues in your church, and for that matter, you shouldn't have monuments in your park, and there's all, they don't have televisions. I mean, the, the strictness varies, but it's all out of a misunderstanding because you shall not make images to worship them. There is a big difference. I can still watch Galaxy Quest with the guys if I was here because that's the movie. It's like one of the best little-known movies ever. And believe me, it's, there's plenty of imagery in there. And I know half the script, so if you can't be at the men's getaway, see me after church. But it, it, that, that, it's, a, it's about false gods. What represents God? Well, here's the good news. If you flip it, we'll ask, what or who represents God? It's not a statue. It's not an animal. It's us. The second commandment's about the church. You get me... And you will be my presence in the world to everybody. You will be Jesus with skin on. Now, you might not be real, good at, be real good at that at this point, maybe because you never realized who you really are. But it's no accident. It's not just a simple metaphor that we refer to as his body. We are his body. Paul said this strange scripture in Galatians. He said, my little children, for whom I am in labor pains, in, until Christ is formed in you. Just as Jesus was formed in the womb of Mary, spiritually speaking, we have been born, the Bible says, an incorruptible seed, the Word of God. Jesus was the Word of God. And he wants us not just to, to know how to behave because we've given our lives to Jesus and now we can learn the code. That's not the purpose. He wants us to be incarnating in Christ. Paul said, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. Paul got what he was saying, and he, he understood what that was the basis of what he said in Galatians, that Christ should be formed in us when he couldn't go to Ephesus. He sent, or to, who was it, Corinthians. He, when he couldn't go to them, he said, but I'm going to send my son in the faith, Timothy. Now, Paul's a single man with no kids. He said, I'm going to send my son in the faith, Timothy, because he will show you my ways. It doesn't mean Timothy's going to go there and say, okay, here's Paul's outlines for the last three years. It's saying, when you're around Paul, you're, when you're around Timothy, you're going to think of me. Man, he is so much like Timothy, or so much like Paul. Sorry, it's the cold talking. He's so-and-so reminds me so much of so-and-so, and then you find out, well, that's who their mentor was. There is something when you realize that, that you are letting Christ be formed in you and that you represent him to the world. Your standards change. Yeah, it does affect your behavior, but they're, they're only evidence of a change. They're not the change. It's not a behavioral change, guys. What, it, what happens instead in you is that there's a, a reformation in you. After you are born again, it's only the beginning of a process. And, and your mind is being renewed, those old habits that, that your pastor, who was it, Dave last night or Mark this morning, talking about old habits that you still want to break. That, that's what we're talking about here. It's not a matter of, of saying, okay, how do I behave now that I'm a Christian? Well, I won't do this, and I won't do that, 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 and I won't do that. Man, if that's your standard of Christianity, you're just keeping up with the local cemetery. Because they don't do any of that stuff. They don't break any of the Ten Commandments. Not a one. They don't like sneak from one grave to another and fool around at night. 
That's too, is, that, is that too risque for... If that's, you better leave now if that's the case. <clears throat> I might cuss. Anyway, I already said hell cajon, so. All right, so he's saying, don't make idols. What he's saying instead is, you get me, and not only you get me, but my spirit will live in you, and he will guide you into all truth. So the do's come to you from the Holy Spirit, and they are different, as we'll see, especially in society in Commandments 6 through 10. They're different for every person, so we'll get to that. What's the third commandment? <clears throat> you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Think that's about cussing? Hell no. <laughs> I warned you. It's not about cussing. Was it Mark Muncy told me last night something Dennis Prager said, that what really is taking the name of the Lord in vain is when pastors get on a platform, woke pastors get on a platform, and, and say that, Abortion is a blessing from the Lord. And then on the other side, there are pastors who believe in the Father, Son, and Donald Trump. And both sides corrupt the gospel. Not all, it's not all this and not all those. I kind of despise both parties equally, so I'm very balanced. But <laughs> no, I, I vote. You just, you'll never know how, but I vote. So what he's, what he's after here. Is representing the name of Jesus. You represent me. How do you do it? You get my name. Use it carefully. You bear the name. To take the name of the Lord, think of when you get married. Typically, especially most Christians, the wife takes the name of her husband. When Dolly and I got married 46 years ago, 46 and a half years ago, I sound old. When Dolly and I got married, um, she took my name. That's a risk for me. I mean, she could write checks. <laughs> she could bankrupt us. She could make us look bad. There could be rumors going around. Or she could make me look good. And in my case, there will be total strangers walk up to me in some state I've never been or some country I've never been, and they will say, thank you for the birthday card or thank you for the gift. She would send people these little dolls, souvenir dolls you get in a certain country. And, Thank you for this, and I'm, I, don't, I have no idea who they are, but I'm thanking them because they're giving me credit for it. But does my wife did it all because she makes me look good. Guess what your job is? You represent Christ. Make him look good. How do you do that? Well, you got a job. If you wear the name of Jesus, you need to do the best job in that, that country is, that company has ever seen if you can. If not, you at least do the best you can do. But if you are going to be mediocre, if you're going to do what's called quiet quitting, that's all the rage now, then keep the fact that if you're going to be mediocre, just keep it a secret that you're a Christian. Is that, is that also too? Am I being mean now? You're dead quiet. I think you're all under conviction, and I'm going to give an off call right now. <laughs> or take an offering. So. Those are the two resorts. So the idea here is that you get me and you represent me. You, I am forming Christ in you as much as you cooperate with me. I'm forming Christ in you so that you're a body. You're my body. You represent me in the world. And you wear my name. If you wear a badge, a uniform of the, pol of the police in California, if you got a CHIPS badge and you walk out and you hold your hand up, traffic will stop. But if you're not a policeman, you are taking that name in vain, and you are going to jail if you get caught. But they will, you don't have the power to stop the traffic in this hand of yours. But that badge means something, and the name of Jesus has infinitely more influence and more power. There is enough power to change all of California in one room, because wherever sin abounds, you check your state lately, wherever sin abounds, Grace abounds much more. Can you, can you believe that the gospel is actually designed to be successful? That's what a concept. It's good news. It's not a flu shot. It's good news. All right. The fourth, the fourth and fifth commands are positives. That is to say, you have to do this. Now, there's room for positives. And there's also a little leeway in a lot of them. Some of them are really strict. Why would the Lord give us this 
These two commandments as positives. In, a, in essence, it's saying, look, you have freedom here, you have freedom here, you've got a lot of freedom here, here are your boundaries. But this, don't forget this, this is important. And he says, keep the Sabbath day set apart. Well, does that mean Friday, Saturday, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown? Because there are whole denominations that say that still applies. It's in the, it, it, you know, will Ten Commandments still apply? If that doesn't apply, none of the commandments apply. Well, they have good consciences about that, and I have some friends who are from churches like that, but that's not what it's talking about. Thank the Lord we have the book of Hebrews in Scripture. And where Paul talked to a couple of the other churches, he said, don't let anyone question you on the lunar calendar or on how you celebrate feasts. Don't let people question you about it. In other words, don't feel guilty if you keep a different schedule. You got to work on Sunday? Okay, you got to work on Sunday, but don't feel guilty about it if you're going to do it. The early church actually started worshiping on Sundays because it was the day of the week that the Lord had been raised from the dead. They did not do away with Sabbath. And look, Jesus gathered up food for his disciples on the Sabbath and was criticized for it. But he said, man wasn't made for the Sabbath, the Sabbath was made for man. So we have freedom, but it is good for us to coordinate that to have a day of worship. Sabbath is not a day to play football and all that kind of stuff. You need recreation. Sabbath, the principle of Sabbath, I'm talking about the principle of Sabbath, is to set aside part of your time in the week, and it's good to have a whole day, where you just step back and rest from your work and contemplate what you've done, assess it, and get ready to make changes for the, for the following week. That's what it's about. I just set somebody free. That's what it's about. It, all, you know, it has to do with communion as well in, in the long run. It's, it's about your identity. Look, what did I just say the first three commandments? And I hope you're believing me. Don't, don't ever fully trust a visitor, even somebody you knew 37 years. But prove it for yourself. But look this up, and I hope it makes sense. I just told you, you get God's Holy Spirit, the author of the book, indwelling in you to tell you what the positives are, and you represent him in the world to all the people, and you get his name to use wisely because it's extremely powerful. It's like the word of God is more sharper than any two-edged sword. It's, it, the name of Jesus is like that because he he's the living word. So I've just told you all this, don't get puffed up. Because one of, the, one of the reasons for the Sabbath is to remind you, you're not the savior of the world. If you've got a Messiah complex, you know, Martha, Martha versus Mary, you overwork, you don't take time off. I mean, pastors do this. You don't take time off. You don't take a full day away. You don't rest. Why? Well, they, I've got to do this. Can't do it without me. Let me tell you, there's only one savior of the world and no applications are being taken. One seat on that throne. There's no room for your posterior. <laughs> it started with a B, not an A, okay? So just want you to know that. All right, so the next commandment, commandment five, is to honor your father and your mother all the days of your life. Why? So that you can live. It's the first commandment was promised, they say. So that you can live a good, productive life. Life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. It's about your inheritance. It's about honoring the past to prepare for the future. Why is this so important? It doesn't say obey your parents for your whole life. It says honor them. You know, the job of a parent, the job of parents is to when you first when you're first born, your parents are the are omnipotent. They feed you. They people say, Oh, my baby loves me. No, you're the kitchen just in it for what he can get out of you, literally. But then he comes to love you. Then he's bonded with you, because you love him instantaneously. I know you do. So when you, ha when you have a child, you are the, that child's first image of God that, God, that that child's first provider, their first food, their first diaper changer, their first judge at some point, their first executor at some point. Well, you don't go to that extreme, but... Hey, you're spanking them, hopefully, and not too hard. But, you know, Solomon said, if you don't, you hate them. So I'd rather go with Solomon than Oprah. So, so you are the first everything to them. But your job as a parent is to raise them to where eventually they don't need you. And you send them out on their own. Anything else, you work that hard on, you mount its head on the living room wall. But your children, you send them out. Go. 
Bring me grandkids. <laughs> right? Now, I'm not going to dwell on this because I dwell on this all the time, especially when I come here. And Dave said yesterday that you had a baby boom after I was here. I'm not sure a traveling speaker wants to hear that. It's <laughs> so one time in the, right down here, I was talking to a couple and a lady who was pranking me walked up holding out a baby and she said, this is your fault. You never say that to a guest speaker. And the Lord, I, truly the Lord rescued me, gave me the right thought. I said, oh, great, where's your husband? And the couple next to me went from mortified to relieved just at that point. So, all right, so it's about, it's transgenerational, if I can use the trans term. It's transgenerational. It's, it's looking to the, for the future. The fifth commandment is a hinge. Your parents represent God to you, but they introduce you to society, and there are five more commandments. How to act in the world. And they've taught you. You honor them all the days of your life. All right, as a parent, speaking up. Listen up, kids. Oh, this, we need the middle schoolers. All right, so commandments 6 through 10. Oh, there's a bunch of nods. You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. And you shall not covet your neighbor's anything. Short version. I think Moses said stuff, but it means anything. So what are these about? Actually, they're related to commandments 1 through 5, and I don't have time to go into it. This is like a two-hour thing crunched into hopefully 35 minutes. I've got about, I don't know, a few left, not many. Ooh, I'm, it's time. All right, here we go. What's the opposite of you shall not murder? Somebody call it out. You shall give life. Who said that? Raise your hand. All right, don't get proud. Yeah. <laughs> you should be a life giver. Well, how are you supposed to be a life giver? Is there something that says, okay, and you got to all be doctors? No. I'll tell you examples. We have a family in our church. The guy's in his 40s. His wife is 39, looks like a teenager. They just have 12. Now they have their 12th child. And they've actually had Christians say to them, you shouldn't bring another mouth into this world to feed. How dare you? How dare you? Good grief. The Lord says, fill up the earth. How are you supposed to do that? We get that in the seventh commandment. How are you supposed to do that? It's not like jackrabbits in Arizona, but it's also not, it's, it's also not and it's not like soap operas, but it's, but it's also not really low birth rates. You know, the dad of those 12 kids said to me when his wife was pregnant with his 11th, I said, what's your limit? He said, I don't know. He said, you know, just God's blessing us and we've got room. And I mean, he's the guy's a plumber. So that's not another word for wealthy either, but he's a plumber. I said, well, so what you know? He said, I don't know. He said, well, you know what? At church, we always talk about children being the heritage of the Lord. Then we go out of our way to not have too many. So I'll leave that. Be a life giver. You might have a lot of kids. You might adopt children. Well, Minnesota congressmen, they adopted, I eventually, I think, 14, 15 kids. Um, you, you might be a doctor with Doctors Without Borders. You might be, I met a young man who's studying to be an EMT. And I said, why do you want to be an EMT? He said, well, I want to represent Christ in the world. And I thought, how do I do that? And I thought, well, if you're an EMT, you get to see somebody on the worst day of their life and make it better. That's Jesus to them. Because I'm going to let them know before I leave something about him. And I thought, man, that's a great guy. I love that kid. He's young, but I love him. It's just so simple, so wonderful. Okay, we'll keep going. The, The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. Now, that's a big, a big thorny one, but let's just flip it into something simple. Love your spouse. Love is a verb, not a feeling. Then emotion has nothing to do with it. So when you get married, you might wake up Monday morning not feeling married or wishing you weren't married, but that rings on your finger, you're married. And, and Scripture says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. What did he do? Go around just saying sweet things and all that? No, he... He gave his life. He laid down his life. Love is a verb, not a feeling. This whole, you know, in order to love others, you've got to love yourself first. I've heard people say that, and then they never get to loving others. The rest of the sermon is about how to learn to love yourself. And Scripture never, ever says, it's talking about how you take care of yourself. It's saying, do for your neighbor exactly what you do for self-maintenance, feed yourself, all the stuff you do for yourself, do for them. It's not you've got soft fuzzies, warm fuzzies for them. Can, let's, let's just get rid of some of the romantic songs. Anyway, not all of them, but, you know, I, I love the song selections you guys have. It's about being pro-marriage and pro-family. 
And it's about your neighbor, so it's about being pro-marriage and pro-family with your neighbor who may be on their third marriage or who has a little boy that 11 years old, three years ago, was delightful. Now he's a 14-year-old goth in the basement who won't come out. The kid's in crisis. Well, who's going to help him? Well, who did God put next door to that family? And you might not even like them, but God put you next door to them. Oh, man, I'd love to talk about that for a little while. All right, the eighth commandment. You all ready for the eight, number eight? You shall not steal. Anybody want to hazard a guess as to what the opposite of that is? Who said work? Work. Yeah, it's about giving. It's especially about work. Because stealing is a shortcut to dominion. Stealing is, about a, short, is a shortcut, just like taking the name of the Lord in vain. It's a shortcut to authority. Stealing is a shortcut to doing things the right way. That's why it's wrong. So Paul's saying, if you're not willing to work, don't give them food. They shouldn't eat. He's being pretty tough at that point. That is tough love. That doesn't mean you don't have mercy. You should always have mercy. But you shouldn't be a patsy because you do people harm if you just indulge them. He's saying work. In fact, with regard to giving, how about this? If you look at this in the context of Scripture in general, it is about producing more than you consume. Marx and Lenin tried to copy that into the, the Communist Manifesto. It hasn't really worked very well. They also promised toilets made of gold. My first question when a communist quoted that to me was, well, yeah, but would they work? So if you've ever been to Russia, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, you shall not steal. Work. All right, go to number nine. I'm going to rip these off in order in a minute, and you're going to see this is a good life. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. That seems kind of random. I mean, the rest of these are so specific. Why has he got to bring that up? You shall not lie about your neighbor bearing false witness. Well, this is about reputation. You wouldn't want it to be lied about. It doesn't say you shall not judge. Well, you know, the Bible says judge not. And that's not the whole sentence, is it? Judge not unless you're prepared to be judged by the standard you imposed is what it's talking about. In fact, Leviticus 19 says, you shall judge your neighbor in fairness. So yeah, there's judgment that has to happen. We make judgments all the time. Even blessing, if, if a court finds you not guilty, you've just been judged. That's a blessing. Blessing and cursing are both judgments. You want one, not the other. But like a bumper sticker should say, judgment happens. They only see one side of it because they only understand judgment is negative. And so do a lot of Christians who wouldn't dare put that bumper sticker on their car. But that's the way they look at it. What it is is to be, is to be concerned with an upright community around you, to judge fairly, to make sure that your community has a good, relationship, a, a good reputation, not just you. It doesn't mean you're the nosiest person on the neighborhood committee or you know the homeowners, whatever. I don't like the way they put that. It's not that. It's just saying, be concerned about standards and not only watch over your own conduct, but because you are part of a collective, you need to be concerned about that collective. And when Israel was exiled in Babylon and the Lord gave them four things via Jeremiah, four things that they should dwell on, the very last one is get involved in the city, the Babylonian city where I've exiled you, because it's... Prosperity, let's see, your, your well-being is wrapped up in its well-being. So he's telling them, get, in, get involved in Babylon, where you've just been exiled because you got conquered. Get involved and bless the city where you live. Now, if you can do that in Babylon, you can do that in El Cajon, you can do that in whatever town you live, whatever community you live in, you can be redemptive. You can give Jesus a good name in that place without compromising his name and just being soft and mushy. Is this making sense? Say yes, because i got to finish. Yes. Thank you. Okay. You shall, last commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's anything. We're talking about wife, household staff, um, children, the, his home, his Tesla, his... I'm sure they had them. They were coal-powered, but I'm sure they had them. You shall, not, you shall not covet anything of your neighbor's. 
What do you flip that? Well, remember the creation mandate, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, um, subdue it, and rule over it. It's about dominion. So is this, so is this, so was the fifth command about, about parents. So this is about dominion. It's about ruling over the part of the world that God has given you and not looking at what your neighbor's got and saying, I want to keep up with the Joneses, those evil Joneses everywhere. I want to keep up with those guys. Man, if we just could do this, it would be so great. They've got plenty of room to do this and do that and do that. <clears throat> you don't know. And besides, you shouldn't be looking at them and, and salivating. Whatever God has blessed you with, whatever you've worked for, rule it for his glory. Because you can rule a small, you know, $800,000 home. That's like, it ain't Florida, let me tell you. You can, you can rule over something small and make it better and more welcoming and more attractive than something large that somebody paid a ton for but is full of unhappy people. People want to come to your little place instead of go to that place. You ever met anybody? They were really wealthy. Did you didn't like hanging around with them? And then you go to somebody else like your grandmother's place and she lives in this little place and they got one bathroom and she's asking you... You know, what is a micro? Can you show me how to operate this microwave, this newfangled? But it's grandma's place and you loved it. Well, guess what? You're, you're, you like grandma's place. Sort of. Don't take it too far. This would be like the shack at that point. But you're like grandma's place. I'm doing all these references and you're just going, <laughs> and some of you are going to get them at 1 30 while you're eating. So the positive is rule wisely. How do you rule? from under, not over. You know, anytime people start talking about the seven mountains, which I think is an, un I like the guy, but I think it's an unfortunate image because it, it implies climbing and taking over. This, and spheres of influence, people call it as well. What you're talking about, if you follow Jesus' model, is that you get into power, you get, or I should say, you get into authority. Authority flows to those who serve. Now, that can be corrupted. You know, if you vote for me, I'll get you free stuff by taking it from somebody else. I will serve you as your congressman. I'll do this and that. You, it can be corrupted. It can be bastardized. It's only half cussing. But yeah, it, it, you know, they, people can ruin it. But what we're after here, what we're after here is, is sorry, I just looked at my time a minute over. It threw me. So I'm sorry. I'm very sensitive to that because I've been known to wax the elephant for way too long. But anyway, I'll wrap up here. I, I want to just, just rule by serving, that's all. Just put yourself at the bottom. One thing I appreciated about Mark and Dave last year is there was a gathering of pastors from San Diego County that were on national television making a statement, and they put a couple of well-known guys strategically based at the microphone. Dave and Mark organized the whole thing with staff here, and then they stood in the back. And the, and the, the national media covered it. That's leadership. I had to say something nice because I get a check later, but no, I really, <laughs> I really mean that. So, all right, so here are the Ten Commandments. Pastor Mark or whomever is coming, I, I want to ask you to come and, and lead the prayer time. Look, you may, I may have in some way, or, or I should say the Holy Spirit may have in some way given you a paradigm, a major paradigm shift by thinking this way thinking of flipping the commandments. Well, it's a wonderful shift to make. So here we are. God says, you know what not to do. It's simple. But what to do can be simple because you get me. You get the creator of the world. You get the author of the book in the, in, in the person of my Holy Spirit, and he's going to guide you. And as he guides you, he's going to guide you into all truth so that you can incarnate Christ more and more. You'll be the kind of person that reminds people around you of Jesus, or if they don't know anything about Jesus, will want them to want to know. So, And then you get to use my son's name, which is more powerful than any weapon that has ever been devised, but you get to use it to bring life to the world rather than destruction. You get to take time off as a reminder <clears throat> of who you really are and, and that you're not the boss. Yeah, you... You, and, and it's a gift to you to take that day off because you can assess your work, prepare, and be better next week. And you can take Holy Communion, which reminds you of your true citizenship. I will add this. 
Your passport doesn't say where you're going, it's where you're from. Your citizenship in heaven is where you're from, but you are here to colonize the earth for Jesus. Because if you look at the end of the book, he comes down to live amongst his people forever. Heaven comes down, but you don't forsake earth to go to heaven forever. That's important. All right, that's, that's enough of that. Okay, and <clears throat> number four, the, that's keep the Sabbath. Number five, you've got a generational change, and you owe so much to the previous generation, especially to your parents, but also to the generation of soldiers. I love the way soldiers are honored these days in the United States. They deserve to be honored because of the, of the danger that they've been put in but especially your parents more than anybody else. And get this, you might have had a lousy home life. You might have had a, a dad who was lousy or not even present. But you still honor, even when you can't say anything good, you still honor who he was because you're here because of him. I know that's hard to hear for some of you. But, oh, I wish I had time to talk about it. It pays Whatever you want to reap from that person, you plant. And if you want respect and faithfulness and showing up on important dates, you do it first. All right. And then be a life giver. Love your family. Love your neighbors. Be concerned about them. Work hard. Do your best work because you're representing Jesus. Don't take shortcuts. Be the best that, you've, that they've ever seen around you. And you will ascend into, into more responsibility, which always means also descending into more work. <clears throat> so that'll happen to you. And then, as I said, be concerned about your community and don't be afraid to stand up and point out what's right when there's time to point out what's wrong and what's right. But you do it in the proper venue. You don't just go around you know, using God's word as a sledgehammer. And, and finally, whatever at the end, if you do the first nine, then at the end, you're going to be a person who lives in dominion. And it may not be over the whole county. It may not be over a whole state. But God has given you what he's given you to, to make it shine for him. And he may place you in positions of authority, in business, in sports, in government, or whatever. But whatever it's in, you're going to shine more than anybody else around you. And the whole time, you're going to be praying that they outshine you. All right, I'm done. Thank you so much. Bye.